The Battle of Pozieres was a two-week struggle for the French village of Pozieres and the ridge on which it stands. During the middle stages of the 1916 Battle of the Somme, though British divisions were involved in most phases of the fighting, Pozieres is primarily remembered as an Australian battle. The fighting ended with the Allied forces in possession of the plateau north and east of the village, in a position to menace the German bastion of Thiepville from the rear. The cost had been very large for both sides and in the words of Australian official historian Charles Bean, the Pozier Ridge is more densely sown with Australian sacrifice than any other place on earth. Prelude the village of Possier, on the Albert Bapaume Road, lies atop a ridge approximately in the centre of what was the British sector of the Somme battlefield. Close by the village is the highest point on the battlefield. Possier was an important German defensive position. The fortified village was an outpost to the second defensive trench system, which had become known to the British as the OG Lines. This German second line extended from beyond Mouquet Farm in the north, ran behind Pozier to the east, then south towards the Bazentin Ridge and the villages of Bazentin Le Petit and Longueval. On 14 July, during the Battle of Bazentin Ridge, this southern section of the German second line was captured by the British Fourth Army of Lieutenant General Sir Henry Rawlinson. The possibility of rolling up the German second line by turning north now presented itself if Pozier could be captured. The British commander-in-chief, General Sir Douglas Haig, lacked the ammunition to immediately execute another broad front attack after 14 July. Believing that Pozier and Thiepville would become untenable for the Germans as the British continued their eastward momentum, Haig ordered Rawlinson to concentrate on the centre between Highwood and Delville Wood as well as the villages of Guillemont and Ginchy. The plan was to maintain the pressure and take Pozier by steady, methodical, step-by-step -step advance. Between 13 and 17 July, the 4th Army made four small attacks against Pozier with no success and high casualties. In this period the village was subjected to a heavy bombardment and reduced to rubble. On two occasions the attacking infantry got into the trench that looped around the south and western edge of the village, known as Pozier Trench but both times were driven out. Attempts to get east of the village by advancing up the OG lines also failed. Battle Capture of Pozier Rawlinson planned to deliver another attack on a broad front on 18 July involving six divisions between the Albert Bapome Road in the north and Guillemont in the south. Haig decided to transfer responsibility for Pozier to the Reserve Army of Lieutenant General Hubert Goff which had been holding the line north of the road since shortly after the opening of the offensive on 1 July. The attack was postponed until the night of 22-23 July. To Goff's army were attached the three Australian divisions of 1st Anzac Corps, which had begun moving from the Armatiers sector. The Australian 1st Division reached Albert on 18 July and despite the postponement of the offensive, Goff, who had a reputation as a thruster, told the division's commander, Major General Harold Walker, I want you to go in and attack Pozier tomorrow night. Walker, an experienced English officer who had led the division since Gallipoli, would have known of it and insisted he would attack only after adequate preparation. Consequently, the attack on Pozier once more fell in line with the 4th Army's attack on the night of 22-23 July. The plan called for the Australian 1st Division to attack Pozier from the south, advancing in three stages half an hour apart, while north of the Albert Bapome Road, the 48th Division would attack the German trenches west of the village. The village and surrounding area was defended by elements of the 117th Division. Early on the 22nd of July the Australian 9th Battalion attempted to improve its position by advancing up the OG lines towards the road but was repulsed. The preparation for the attack involved a thorough bombardment of the village and the OG lines lasting several days. The bombardment included phosgene and tear gas. 
The infantry were scheduled to attack at 12.30 a.m. on 23 July with the Australian 1st and 3rd Brigades. The infantry crept into no man's land, close behind the bombardment and when it lifted the German trenches were rushed. The first stage took the Pozier trench that ringed the village to the south. The second stage saw the Australians advance to the edge of the village, amongst what remained of the back gardens of the houses lining the Albert Bapome Road. The third stage brought the line to the Albert Bapome Road. The few survivors from the German garrison retreated to the northern edge of the village or into the OG lines to the east. It was also intended that the OG lines would be captured as far as the road but here the Australians failed partly due to strong resistance from the German defenders in deep dugouts and machine gun nests and partly due to the confusion of a night attack on featureless terrain. The weeks of bombardment had reduced the ridge to a field of craters and it was virtually impossible to distinguish where a trench line had run. The failure to take the OG lines made the eastern end of Pozier vulnerable and so the Australians formed a flank short of their objectives. On the western edge of the village, the Australians captured a German bunker known as Gibraltar. That night the 8th Battalion of the Australian 2nd Brigade, which had been in reserve, moved up and secured the rest of the village. The attack of the 48th Division on the German trenches west of Pozier achieved some success but the main attack by the 4th Army between Pozier and Guillemont was a costly failure. Defence of Pozier's success on the Somme came at a cost which at times seemed to surpass the cost of failure, and for the Australians, Pozier was such a case. As a consequence of being the sole British gain on 23 July, Pozier became a focus of attention for the Germans, forming as it did a critical element of their defensive system. The German command ordered that it be retaken at all costs. Three attempts were made on 23 July but each was broken up by the British artillery or swept away by machine gun fire. Communication was as difficult for the Germans as it was for the British, and it was not until 7 a.m. the 24th of July that they discovered that Pozier had been captured. With British activity now declining elsewhere on its front, the German 4th Corps opposite Pozier was able to concentrate most of its artillery against the village and its approaches. Initially the bombardment was methodical and relentless without being intense. The western approach to the village, which led from Casualty Corner near the head of Sausage Valley, received such a concentration of shell fire that it was thereafter known as Dead Man's Road. The German bombardment intensified on 25 July, in preparation for another counter-attack. The German 9th Corps relieved 4th Corps and the commander cancelled the planned counter-attack, choosing to concentrate on the defence of the OG lines, which were the next objective of the British. The bombardment reached a climax on 26 July and by 5 p.m., the Australians, believing an attack was imminent, appealed for a counter-barrage. The artillery of 1st Anzac Corps, 2nd Corps and the guns of the two neighbouring British Corps replied. This in turn led the Germans to believe the Australians were preparing to attack and so they increased their fire yet again. It was not until midnight that the shelling subsided. At its peak, the German bombardment of Pozier was the equal of anything yet experienced on the Western Front and far surpassed the worst shelling previously endured by an Australian division. The Australian 1st Division suffered 5,285 casualties on its first tour of Pozier. When the survivors were relieved on 27 July, one observer said they looked like men who had been in hell, drawn and haggard in so days that they appeared to be walking in a dream and their eyes looked glassy and starey. E. J. ruled the OG lines on 24 July. Once Pozier had been secured, General Goff pushed for immediate moves against the OG lines north and east of the village. The first task was to take the lines up to the Albert Bapome Road, the original objectives which had not been captured. Attacking in the dark, only the Australian 5th Battalion found either of the OG trenches and it was counter-attacked by the German 18th Reserve Division. 
Simultaneously on the Australians' right, the British 1st Division made an attempt to capture Munster Alley, the section of the switch line where it intersected the OG lines. A tumultuous bomb fight developed but only a small section of trench was held. Before it was withdrawn, the Australian 1st Division had attempted to prepare a jumping-off line for the assault on the OG lines. The Australian 2nd Division took over the sector on 27 July and General Goff, eager for progress, pressed for an immediate attack. The division's commander, General Gordon Legg, lacked the experience and confidence of General Walker and succumbed to pressure from Goff. On the night of 28-29 July, in conditions far less favourable than those experienced by the 1st Division on the night of 22-23 July, the 2nd Division was expected to attack. The remorseless German bombardment made effective preparations virtually impossible. The dust raised by the shelling prevented the Australian artillery observers from directing their field guns which were tasked with cutting their barbed wire entanglements. An attack by the British 23rd Division on Munster Alley dragged in the Australian 5th Brigade. The ensuing bomb fight saw the British and Australian infantry expend over 15,000 grenades. The main attack went ahead, scheduled to start at 12.15 a.m. on 29 July but the Australian 7th Brigade was late in reaching its start line and its movement was detected by the German defenders. When the attack commenced, the Australians were met by a hail of machine gun fire. South of the road the 5th Brigade remained pinned down, unable to even get started. On their left, north of the road, the 7th Brigade encountered uncut wire. On the northern flank some minor progress was made by the 6th Brigade but everywhere else the attack was a failure. Including the attack and the preceding day of preparation the 2nd Division lost over 3,500 men. The 7th Brigade had to be withdrawn to reserve. So great were its losses. General Haig was disparaging of the division's failure, telling Lieutenant General William Birdwood, the first Anzac Corps commander, you're not fighting Bashi by Zooks now. General Legg and the I Anzac staff resolved to do the job properly. To avoid the confusion of a night advance, the plan was to attack at 9.15 p.m., just before dark at which time the crest of the ridge and the mound of the Possier windmill would still be discernible. However, to attack at dusk meant assembling by day which was only possible to do in the protection of trenches. Therefore, a system of approach and assembly trenches had to be dug at night. Whenever the Germans detected digging parties, they mistook them for troops assembling to attack and called down a barrage. Originally the attack was to be made at dusk on 2 August but the trenches were as yet incomplete, the digging either being disrupted or the completed trenches demolished by shellfire. The attack was first postponed to 3 August and then to 4 August when the trenches were finally deemed ready. This careful planning and preparation delivered success and when the 2nd Division went in, both OG lines were captured. South of an astride the Albert Bapome Road the OG lines had been so thoroughly obliterated by prolonged shelling that the Australians ended up advancing beyond their objectives. From their vantage in the OG lines on the eastern edge of the Posier Ridge, the Australians now looked over green countryside. The village of course looked close by and the woods around Bapome, five miles distant. The German commander ordered, at any price hill, 160 Posier Ridge must be recovered. Final counter-attack by the 5th of August, the brigades of the 2nd Australian Division were exhausted and were to be relieved by the 4th Australian Division. While the relief was underway on the night of 5 to 6 August, the Australians were subjected to an extreme bombardment because the salient they occupied could be shelled by the Germans from all directions, including from Thiepville which lay to the rear. On the morning of 6 August, a German counter-attack tried to approach the OG lines but was met by machine gun fire and forced to dig in. The bombardment continued through the day, by the end of which most of the 2nd Division had been relieved. 
From its 12 days in the line, the division had suffered 6,848 casualties. At 4 a.m. on 7 August, shortly before dawn, the Germans launched their final counter-attack. On a front of 400 yards they overran the thinly occupied OG lines, catching most of the Australians in shelters in the old German dugouts and advanced towards Pozier. For the Australians, the crisis had arrived. At this moment, Lieutenant Albert Jacker, who had won the Victoria Cross at Gallipoli, emerged from a dugout where he and seven men of his platoon had been isolated, and charged the German line from the rear. His example inspired other Australians scattered across the plateau to join the action and a fierce, hand-to-hand -hand fight developed. No more attempts to retake Possier were made. Aftermath Analysis since taking over the Pozier sector, General Goff's plan had been to drive a wedge behind the German fortress of Thietville. Having secured Pozier and the neighboring section of the OG lines, the attack now moved to the next phase, a drive north along the ridge towards the German strongpoint of Mouquet Farm which protected the rear of Thietville. First Anzac Corps would carry the advance along the ridge while, on their left, Second Corps would keep in line, systematically reducing the Thiepville salient. Initially the task fell to the 4th Australian Division, which had already suffered 1,000 casualties, resisting the final German counter-attack but both the Australian 1st and 2nd Divisions would be called on again, followed once more by the 4th Division. When the Australian ordeal on Pozier Ridge was over in September, they were replaced by the Canadian Corps who held the sector for the remainder of the battle. The OG lines east of the village became the Canadian start line for the Battle of Flores Corslet. After the battle it became apparent that General Birdwood had lost much of his Gallipoli popularity through his failure to oppose Goff's impetuous desire for quick results, and his lack of thought at Pozier. Soon after, Australian troops rejected his personal appeal for the introduction of conscription, voting against this recommendation largely because of their reluctance to see additional men subjected to the horrors of piecemeal attacks. The Australians had suffered many losses in the battle for Pozier in six weeks, as they had in the Gallipoli campaign. Wilfred Miles, the official historian, praised the initiative shown by small subunits of men in clearing the Germans from positions in the village but at the same time attributed much of the severity of losses to Australian inexperience and their reckless daring casualties in the fighting around Pozier. The 48th Division lost 2,844 casualties from 16 to 28 July and 2,505 more from 13 August. The 1st Australian Division lost 7,700 men. The 2nd Australian Division had 8,100 casualties and the 4th Australian Division lost 7,100 men. From 27 July 13 August the 12th Division had 2,717 losses.